Okay. <coughs> Good morning. Today is 1 May, the year 2007. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Bill Vaughn, and today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Watson Vaughn. Sergeant Vaughn was a tail gunner on the Rose of York, a B-17 named in honor of Princess Elizabeth during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. What? Nice to have you here. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Um, now let's get it set up here. Okay. First of all, uh, tell us uh, when and where you were born. I was born in Winona, Minnesota, in 1922, on December 6th, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> left there and went to school and was in, in Wisconsin. Well, when we get to December 7th, I'm sure you'll remember <laughs> what was going on then. Yeah. Um, and how you spell that uh, town? W-I-N-O-N-A, Minnesota. And whereabouts is that? That's 110 miles south of Minneapolis, right on the Mississippi River. Okay. And your father, what was his name? His name was William. And what did he do? He, he was in the CCCs. He tried farming and he ended up being in the restaurant business and then finally moved out to Seattle, Washington after I got there. Okay, um, and so when did he leave for Seattle? He left you... in 1942, I brought him out there. Oh, you did? Okay. And um, uh, his ancestors, your, uh, where did they all come from? How did he end up? Most, I, I followed my ancestors, they're mostly all Scotch and Irish, some English involved, but mostly Irish up from around Dublin. The Vaughan name came from Dublin. So, and my great-grandmother came from Scotland, so you can call me what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but when they first came over, where did they kind of settle? How did they end up? Uh, 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 I, I, I can't answer that for sure, but I do know that they all ended up right in the Wisconsin, Minnesota area. Yeah. Okay. And your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Her, her maiden name was Laura Dyer, D-Y-A-R, um, born and raised in Wisconsin, uh, of a farmer. and. Um, she was the oldest of, of five children, and um, and her ancestors. Do you know where her ancestors were English, Irish, and some German. The Dyer was German. And did you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah, I had nine, bro uh, ten brothers and ten uh, brothers and sisters. Wow. There was eleven of us in our family. Do we dare try to name all of them? Oh no, I can name them all. Okay. Uh, the ones living, my oldest brother is living at ninety, and my oldest okay. sister is living at eighty-eight, and my brother just older than me. Uh, died uh, in 1986, then there's me, I was fourth, and then the brother younger than me is dead. Then I have a sister, and then I have another brother, then I have two sisters, and then I have another brother, and then my youngest sister died when she was quite young. And their names? Oh, the oldest brother is Bill, and then Marguerite, and then there was Marion, and then Watson, and then Raymond, and then Dorothy, and then James, and then Beverly, and Patricia, and uh, Bob and Darlene. And where did Watson come from, your name? It's a, it's a uh, Scottish name, I found out. Uh, it's, a, it's a surname over in Scotland, uh, surprisingly. By surname, that's the, fir your fir the first name? No, or the that's last, last, name. last name. Oh, yeah. wait, so were there any Watsons in your family? Well, with my great-grandmother, Vigholtz, her maiden name was Watson. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you grew up kind of during the Depression. What was that like for your family? Tough. Nobody was as poor as we were growing up. Uh, being that we were as many as we were, and we tried to farm, and the bank owned the farm. We didn't own nothing. And when I was 14, I pretty well left home and went out and worked on the farms. I went to school and uh, stayed that way until I got out of high school, and I ended up having a scholarship to La Crosse State Teachers College and uh, went two weeks, and Bill's brother, Billy's brother, my oldest brother came out back from Seattle and I said, that sounds like where I want to go and I went to Seattle and went to work for Boeing for a couple of months and and then fiddled around um, probably a year in Seattle in the parking lots and so on and 
then was drafted. I tried to join the Air Force, but they wouldn't take me because of my eyes, and then eventually got drafted and okay. then became Air Force. All right. Okay, well, let, but let's go back a little bit about it and, uh, growing up. Um, now, that town, how big a town is, was Winona? Winona is a town today probably of around, in those days, probably around 28,000, 30,000. And did you live right in the town? No, we didn't. We lived over in the Wisconsin side on farms and uh, just moved from one farm to another until the bank took it back or whatever. And um, uh, on the farms, what did you raise? Uh, it was dairy farm. It was a dairy farm. And my dad went out and worked on WPA and left us. Tell us a little bit about WPA. Well, that was a program that President Roosevelt put in, and it was a reforestation and rebuilding of roads and reforestation of the of the uh, forest and the woods, so forth. Mostly road building. Was that different than the CCC? No, the CCC was strictly forestation. Uh -huh. Yeah, my dad ended up being a cook in the CCCs for about 15 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it went that long. Huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And. Um, you were, um, uh, so you probably didn't have, you were probably working pretty much all the time when you were a kid, but yeah. what did you guys do for fun when you had a chance? I, I, I happened to be, I don't know why, but I was the athlete of our family, of all the brothers and sisters, and from the time I was a freshman in high school, I was on the, the major teams of, of baseball and basketball mm -hmm. and boxing, and that's all we had in that school, and I ended up uh, go, moving to another town, and um, Finished in the last two years, and I, I was a basketball, um, uh, baseball, and boxing also. How tall were you then? I was about 5'11". Oh, okay. Yeah, I was big. Yeah, for those <laughs> days, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so you finished, what, what high school did you finish up I at? finished in a town called Cochran, Wisconsin, which is right across the river from Winona, Minnesota. A town of about 500 population. Yeah. What, what, how was your team? Our team? Basketball team. Our basketball team, uh, both years when I played there, uh, first year we, we got to the semifinals in the state and uh, last year we got into the to the semifinals again. We were in the semifinals both times. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. In those days, I'm from Indiana and we oh, yeah. have basketball and now they have 5A, 4A, 3A, but yeah. then everybody was lumped together yeah. in the little teams and the big teams. Yeah. Was we, it like that for you guys? or did were you No, we there? were Class C, which is about the lowest it could be. I think it was the town was 500 population. I think we had 20 in my senior class. And, yeah. <laughs> and where did you go to grade school, to grammar school? I went to grade school in several different little towns prior to Cochrane, and uh, mostly up around Rice Lake and Bruce and Eau Claire, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. up in the central part, all farming. Yeah. Um, did you milk a lot of cows? No, I think the bank owned about 12, 14 cows, and. We got half of the milk check, I can remember that, and tried to live on that, and when you're raising that kind of a family, it wasn't, wasn't very prosperous. But working on the farms, is that, what did you mainly do? Did you milk the cows? I started things? milking cows when I was probably eight, nine years old, and, uh, and, and drove the horses on the plows and the discs and, the, yeah. and whatever. Hey. Did you do any hunting or fishing? Oh, or yeah. Like yeah that? Being, being farmers, that's what we lived on. We, we, we hunted deer and squirrel and rabbit and uh, ducks did a lot of fishing, we were on the lakes, and uh, that's probably what kept us going as much as anything else. Were you interested in aviation when you were a kid? No, much? no, no, no. So you graduated, when did, what year did you graduate from I graduated in, in uh, spring of, fifth, of 41. Okay, and, um, and then you went to La Crosse? I went to La Crosse State Teachers College for about two weeks, I think it was, and then went out to Washington with, with Bill's dad and, and we got there in probably um, November of 41. Now, that was one of your brothers? Yes, that was Bill's dad. And what was his name? Bill William oh, okay. also. Yeah. Okay, all right. He was the oldest brother of the family, and he had went out there and was working. Oh. And came back and got his family, and then I rode out with him and, and stayed in Seattle. And this was in 41? In 41, 1941. We got there probably in November of 41. And you started working with Boeing, did you say? I started working for Boeing probably within two weeks after I got to Seattle. Worked only worked for him for three or four months, and then. Do you remember what you were doing on December seventh? Um, I was probably working for Boeing. 
I, I think I was working for Boeing because I went to work for him quite a, soon after I got to Seattle. Could you see, uh, were you up on military, uh, world history and stuff? Did you see something like this coming? No. Absolutely. And what about Boeing? I mean, they were, were they really geared up and going, um, going strong at that point? Or I don't think that they were at that point when I went to work for them probably I, I, because there was no war and, right. and they were mostly peacetime and we weren't building bombers. I, I forget what we were building. I was, I was a riveter, I can remember that. A rivet yeah. bucker, I guess they call it. Yeah. And I don't even remember what type of airplane I was, I was working on. Yeah. Only worked there three months. And then? Then I went in and worked in the parking lots downtown, worked in the parking cars and oh, yeah. did that until I went into service. Okay. And so, and when were you drafted then? I was drafted February, I think February 4th, 1943, and uh, went into the Army and they asked me what branch of service I wanted to go into and I said Air Force and they put me in the Air Force. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. And so, uh, and where'd you go for your basic training? I went to Fresno, California uh, for basic training. Um, they had, uh, it was an old fairgrounds there and they'd set up a, a temporary training and and I was there for, for that and was probably there two months at the most, I think. And where'd you go from there? We went, and then I went from there to Denver, Colorado, where I went through uh, gunnery school uh, on, B, on, on 50 calibers, 30 calibers, and 20 millimeters. And from, there was two bases right in Denver. One was Lowry, there was actually three, Lowry, one, Lowry, two, and Buckley. And between the three bases, they taught us the three different guns. Was there about um, two months, probably two to three months. Did you like that? Did you like? Uh, yes, uh, I was interested in it. Because you used, you're yeah. used to shooting and. I was interested in in, in 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 the weaponry. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know it's kind of. If I would have been had to go, I, I yeah. that kind of I think I would have liked that too. The, yeah, as soon as soon as we yeah, 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 we finished we finished our gunnery school there, then they shipped us down to a place called Laredo, Texas, which is right on the <laughs> right on the border of Mexico, Streets and we went through Laredo. aerial gunnery school. I had never flown in an airplane. Uh, I had never shot anything more than a probably a 30-30 ammunition, and um, they put us in an AT-6, and um, we were up, up in the air to shoot at a sock that was being towed by another airplane, and we all had different colored bullets in our guns and when we got down we had to count to see how many hits we got out of so many rounds and and I was in gunnery school about two months and finished it and you had average 10 percent I don't know if I lied or not but I, I got 10 percent <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so then where did you go from there from there I went to a place and called by the way uh, did you have a girlfriend or anything like that? Did you, have any, you were serious about no, that? I was not, no, I was not serious. I was an athlete in those days. I didn't have time for girls, mostly. <laughs> I, I knew women, but I didn't have anybody standing, no. Did you play any sports in the in the service when you were in? Yes, when I, when I came back from overseas, okay. I did. I played. That's all I did. Okay. Yeah. We'll get to that then. All right. But when I, when I left um, Laredo, Texas to join and become uh, crew members, we went to and remember, we went to Dalhart first or Pio, Texas. Both of them were in Texas. I don't remember which, which place I went first to get my crew. I went in there and then they just lined you up to whatever. They didn't ask if you wanted to be a tail gunner. They said, you're a tail gunner, you're a volunteer gunner, and so on, and that's And I can't remember, but I was in both those bases and probably all together two months. We And all we did was just go up in the air and train and uh, shoot guns. Uh, we shot at a lot of socks and learning your weaponry. And, and what kind was, of planes were you? It was a B-17. It was a B-17. I was in the B-17. I think they were Fs and uh -huh. probably even before that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, when did you finally get your crew together and stuff? And where well, was that, that? We were together then. That's oh, when were, that's we had? formed our crew. Was in Dalhart. And then we went to Payot and flew about a month down there. And we were then a, a full crew. We had uh, picked up how they put us together. I have no idea. I ended up, as he said, you're a tail gunner, and that's how come I am being what I was. And, right. 
And did you stay with that crew all, all the time? Yes, I stayed with that crew until we got through our training and from there we went up to Salt Lake City and picked up our all of our equipment that we needed to go overseas with and from there we went to a place called Grand Island, Nebraska which was a base that they when we got there they took and split our crew in half. There was ten men to a crew and they took and put five in one airplane and five in another airplane put us with an ATC crew, an Air Transport Command, which was a pilot, navigator, and radio man. And we started overseas that way. And we were flying with those five men that I had trained with in our crew. We got as far as Chicago, ran into a bad snowstorm, had to land, and we all got to go downtown with our flying clothes on, so we were all a freak of nature. And uh, land, was there for two days, and took off and got as far as Portland, Maine and lost an engine and went down again and got that fixed and ended up in Presque Isle, Maine. And uh, I, I can't tell you why we were in Presque Isle, Maine other than it was the last jumping off place before we went overseas. Yeah, I think it so, was colder than hell and uh, nothing to do and very, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a hell hole. We left there then and went and flew into Goose Bay, Labrador, just long enough to refuel and get something to eat. And we took off from Goose Bay, Labrador one night. Let me get this exactly right because it's so long ago. We took off probably about 8 o'clock at night, 8.30 at night and uh, headed for a place called Nuts Corner in Ireland, the land. Um, got down to um, Ireland and it was zero weather. And, uh, pardon me while I get myself. We flew between um, Ireland and Scotland trying to find land. We couldn't, we was zero weather, we couldn't see. And. Um, I think it was about 10 or 10.30, we finally spotted a little piece of ground, so the pilot says, I'm gonna to try to take the plane down. Anybody wanna jump? And we all decided to go with him. And we went down, we crash landed about 35 miles south of Belfast in the farmer's pasture. And nobody got hurt very bad. We Three guys got cut up, banged up, but not bad. So we were there in Belfast then for about seven days and uh, ended up trying to go down through the channels to, to catch our crew, which has already had been over there two or three weeks ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to our crew, they had already started flying, so then we just became spare gunners, spare pilots, or whatever they needed, and I was a tail gunner. When you were uh, going down to crash land there, what was that? Can you? Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I know myself, thinking. Just I'm speaking just for myself, I can't tell about the other guys, but somebody had stepped on my parachute, and my parachute was just laying out all over the, the, the waste compartment of the airplane. And I, didn't, I couldn't jump because I didn't have a parachute. And uh, if, if you've ever went through a crash landing, and, and the procedures they do is, they, the only ones they keep up in front is the pilot and the co-pilot, and they make the rest of you go back in the radio room and you lay down like logs on top of one another. And my job, being a tail gunner, I was on the very top. And when you hit the ground, my job was then to f throw the radio hatch off. At that time, we didn't even have, I think we had a radio hatch, I'm not sure. But we didn't have one for a long time, I remember. So we hit and I could feel us go back up again. So we, and we didn't know where we were at or what was going on. So then we hit again and then we came down and we only went about 200 yards and we, we stopped. And, we were in a farmer's pasture, and the weather was very soggy, very rainy, very soggy. The plane just dropped right down out of sight. When I jumped off on the wing, I could walk off the wing onto the ground, only it was about a foot off the ground, foot and a half off the ground, so you can see how fast we sunk. Was that a wheels down or wheels up? We had a wheels up landing, and uh, I mean wheels down landing, pardon me, wheels down landing, and um, you know, I can't remember, I don't even remember the pilot's name because he was an ATC crew, and we never saw him after that. I never saw him again. 
but we didn't know where we were at because we had no communication. Yeah. And finally, we saw this man and woman and a, a younger daughter come across this large field, probably a couple hundred acre field. And um, they came over and wanted to know if anybody was hurt, and we told them, yeah, and they said they'd already called the, it'd be the same as our Coast Guard base, but that wasn't what they called it. And they asked us if we were hungry, and, and we'd been in the air about 11 or 12 hours, and we were hungry. So they went back and fixed sandwiches and crumpets and tea and came out, and by the time they got back out, there was probably seven, several hundred people out there. And, uh, and then finally, the, the uh, Navy Coast Guard base came over and uh, took our wounded guys in one, in one truck and then took us back to their base and fed us rum until we were rummy. And uh, <laughs> by that time, I think our Americans came down out of, out of Belfast and picked us up and we stayed there. Do you know if they were able to salvage that B-17? Uh, a long story short, I'm, I'm, I'm golfing at, out here in Palm Desert three years ago, got on the tee and I said, to the, this guy said to the woman, he says, you're English? And she says, no, I'm Irish. And I said, where are you from? And she says, Belfast. And I said, did you ever hear of a town called Carrick Fergus? Oh yeah, she said, I used to go down and stay with my grandmother all the time. I said, did you ever see a B-17 out on the farmer's pasture? She says, yeah. She said, we used to play house in that all the time. <laughs> now that's how small of a world we are in. Oh my gosh. And, but she said they, dis they did dismantle it and took it out of there. It took about a year and a half, she said, before I got out of there. Yeah. Um, might be a good time. Let's, let's go over to this B-17 next to you and uh, let's talk about it a little bit. And uh, here you can, you can do this. You can kind okay. of point some here. I'm going to put that over to you. Um, let's look at the, the B-17, the closest one to you there, and uh, give us, point out some of the characteristics of the B-17. That's a G model, I believe, because it has a chin turret. This, this was the first plane that I flew overseas. I trained in, in, in an F model, but we took, a, we took a G model over, but we cracked it up. But the G model was, was the first one with the turret, and the bombardier handled the turret guns up here. The navigator handled the two, there's two guns, one on either side of the fuselage here that the navigator handled. And then the, the, the engineer, the aerial engineer handled this upper turret, uh -huh. pilot and co-pilot actually in there. The, the uh, radio man, I can't hardly see this. Right about there. I right in here it is. Yeah. Radio man had, had, gun, had a gun there, he only had a single, I think he only had a single gun. And then both of the waist gunners on either side, and we only carried one waist gunner, and he fired both of these guns, no matter which side we're being attacked on. Mm -hmm. and then the ball turret gunner had two guns down there, and then I had the two guns in the tail, which were mounted on a tripod, and I just had a ring and bead sight that I, that I, I, I fired through. The turrets all had uh, a, a automatic bomb sight that all you had to do is put that sight on the plane and it would put your guns whichever direction you needed to, to fight. We, we'd we have to figure air speed and air droppage and so forth with it. Mm -hmm. Didn't have that. Yeah. And uh, your bomb load would... We would we would carry anything from... I would probably say the smallest bomb load we would have would probably be a couple thousand pounds up to five, eight thousand pounds, depending on what type of bombs. We, we dropped everything from incendiaries to uh, thousand pound um, demolition bombs. And uh, so we never, I'll tell you the truth, half the time I never knew what type of a bomb load we had because I never, I would never go to the yeah. bomb bay and, and look at it. Right, yeah. Okay, well that's good. Um, so when you left uh, Ireland, then where did you go? Did you, where was your well? Next place? After I left Ireland, then I then I went over to, to Scotland and got a tra train. We went down to a place called Stone, England, and uh, while I was there, they were locating then the rest of my crew, the other half of my crew that I had trained with, and they were up in a place called Thurlay. It was the 306 bomb group. So we got straightened around there about a week later and got up there. A, I don't remember if it was the last of 43 or the first of 44. 
But when we got up there, they had already started flying with other crews, and we didn't have a crew anymore. So then we all became, I became a spare tail gunner, and we had the waist gunner and the ball turret gunner, and the uh, co-pilot was with us and, the, and our own navigator. So we all then became, uh, and so I just flew as a spare tail gunner for the first six missions until wherever they needed me. and. and uh, in, uh, in those first six missions, anything uh, stand out in your mind, or especially your first one, what was that like? Well, my first mission, yeah, I think you'll always remember your first mission probably the most. I was flying with a man by the name of Lieutenant Allen, and we were going to Augsburg, Germany, if you know, that's on, uh, oh, it's on the Swiss border. And by the time we got to the Rhine River, we were all out of ammunition, and we had to fly in and bomb. Um, we came back and um, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. That's fine. That's okay. Um. Did you have some losses on that? Yeah, there's only three of us came back. Out of, out of how many? Eighteen. And this was uh, what month and what year was this then? Um, I, never, I never thought I'd do this. This was in January of 43. Okay. Yeah, it was in January of 43. So that's, that's a tough time because you didn't really have a uh, fighter escort. No, no. We, we, by the time we got the Rhine River, we were all out, out of ammunition. We'd had that many fighter attacks. And, uh, the ME 109s and Fock Wolves? Pardon ME one oh ME one oh nines and Focwolf's. Well yeah, and they had the had the Focwolf two tens and the Focwolf one nineties and uh, surprising in the early part of the war we used to get hit with a lot of Focwolf two tens. Why I don't know, but ME me one oh nines was the worst that was the best plane they had. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, you were out of ammunition, did you huh. I mean what's it like? Um, you don't have it's, it's not like a fighter where you can be right on somebody. I suppose you just, uh, if some, you see some, a couple of bursts, and that's about all. Or that's what? all. You can only burst so long at a time anyway. If you do, if you do it long enough, you'll burn out your barrels. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are all air-cooled, and uh, yeah, you, you only probably did a two or three second burst. Right. Um, I carried 2,800 rounds of ammunition in the tail, and uh, um, the ball turret gunner probably had the least amount of ammunition because he had no room for it. I, I don't remember what the tail gunners carried, I, I mean the waist gunners, but I do remember I had 2,800 rounds in the tail. And that would be one continuous belt? Pretty much. No, it was, uh, we had the two belts, and I have to tell everybody, I told everybody today, it was asking me, when we were on the ground, we would put our, our, our cartridge in the chamber because that, once we got in the air, it was froze shut and you, and you couldn't load them. So we would, we would chamber our cartridges on the ground, and then when we were in the air, as we would see our ammunition going down, we could hook the two belts we had coming out of the gun into two ammunition boxes on either side that would give us another thousand rounds of ammunition, basically. But you had to do that uh, in the air, because you couldn't hook them up on the ground. There wasn't any, there wasn't any room. Could you tell if you were getting any hits or not? Um, you know, no, really, because we had we had we had uh, tracer bullets in those days. About every eighth, seventh or eighth bullet, I think, was a tracer. Mm -hmm. uh, a tracer could go under an airplane or an over an airplane, and you would lose it for that little time, but you might not be hitting the airplane. And they ev eventually took it away from us. I think I probably flew five or six missions. They took the tracers away from us because of that. It, it just wasn't accurate. Yeah, it was fun, but it wasn't accurate. So it wasn't as accurate as no. the, your other. You know. No, you, and, and in the tail, like I said, you, you did it all with a ring and bead sight. You had a, you had a ring out there, and you had a bead back here, a ring here, and then you had your bead out there. And what you did is you counted 1,000, 1, 1,000, 2, depending on which way that airplane was going, how much you had to shoot above them or below them or whatever to, to get them. You know? The ones that you saw, were they usually going across? Crossways. I had them come in like this on us a lot, right. and uh, most of the time they was coming in kind of from the eleven o'clock uh, back in. The, they in, wouldn't try and come in. Not, right, not no. Right, knowing that no. you 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 were right there. Yeah, their rate of enclosure was it was just it just we had yeah. too many shots right at angles, them. Yeah. 
but they would come out of the sky a lot. They'd come out of the sun. We would see most of our attacks, I would say, came from 7 o'clock high to 5 o'clock high. You know. And they talk about the integrity of the box where you're keeping so that you can cover each other more or less. And there's more guns to bear, oh, yeah. the more closer you are together. Yeah. Uh, well, you have about 13 or so in, in your box as a rule. Well, we had you no. Know, you, you fly. You fly in, in in three squadrons, and these three squadrons make a group. You have a lead squadron of six airplanes, and, and they're the first ones. Then you have a high squadron of six airplanes just above you. Then you have a squadron of six airplanes just below you. So you have eighteen airplanes, and at any given time, every airplane could probably train at least five to six guns on an enemy aircraft. So if you had five or six guns plus 18 planes, you had quite a bit of, and that's why we could fly daytime over the British. Right. The British couldn't do this. Yeah. But it, uh, but without your own fighters to help you, it oh, still was, no, it, it was, was tough. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see good fighter escort until about the time that our airplane was christened by, by the Queen princess and that was probably the last of May when we found, probably saw our first escorts coming in good we would they'd take us into maybe Paris or a little past Paris and and then they got the wing tanks and then they could they could just they would they would alternate one would take us into Paris and then the next one to pick us up from Paris right. and take us into Merseyburg and then they would pick us up in the same way coming back but there was so many of us up there that they didn't have enough fighters to cover every bomb group that was flying you know and, but uh, did you take a lot? Of, did your plane take much damage on that first mission? Yeah, we had a lot of flak damage and 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 and, uh, uh, and um, fighter damage from from. Um, we didn't have any really big pieces of the airplane knocked away, at, which I did later on. But uh, we had a lot of holes in it, and, uh, and those um, Me One Hundred Nines, they had cannons, didn't they? They some of them were, some of them were, some of them were, were just regular machine guns like ours, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them had some had a cannon, and uh, we saw. I think most of them that I, I always tell everybody that uh, as you flew over there and got used to the different fighters, uh, they had a group called the Goring Bunch, which was all yellow nose, and they could be either one hundred nines or or like the Abbeville boys. Yeah. And they were they were the best. They yeah, they cool. would come down right through your formation. You either got out of the way or they took you with them. You know, when we when we got near Hamburg and Berlin and that, we always had terrible, tough times with fighters up there. Right. But that was our job when we first started was going and knocking out fighter bases. That's what we were doing in so Augsburg and Frankfurt, and and we were just knocking out everybody's base that we could find. And that was all, probably all we did the first. I would say my first six eight missions. That's all we did was. And you missions. were with different crews and different yes. planes. I was on a different crew every day for the six time. for the first six crew uh, missions. I flew with different crews and uh, um, never got to really know them. Just they'd call my name and say, Sergeant Vaughn, you're tail gunner on 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 whatever plane today. I meant to ask you when you were growing up, if your family was very religious, did you go to church a lot? Yeah, yeah we are religious. And what uh, what uh, what church did you go to? Luther. Uh, yeah. And still do. Yeah, and I suppose that that was a big part yep. of being over there. That. Uh, yeah, that's that's part of it. it um, yeah. You know, so said I never thought I'd ever sit here and cry a little bit about this. And, um, you just think it's 60, what, 63 years ago or 64 years ago, no longer than that. Let's see, I, I finished in 43, so it's 50, 64 years ago. Yeah. But it's, it's amazing how it will come back on you. You can visualize it. Uh, so when did you get your, uh, your, your, your regular plane then? Or, or we got the Rosa York. I got transferred onto the Rosa York. I was, it was been, been my seventh mission. Okay, let's put, let's put this over here. I'm going to come down on that and, uh, and tell us what is uh, unique about the Rose of York. Well, the Rose, the Rose of York, when we got it, was a Princess Elizabeth. It was, it had, he had just put Prince Elizabeth on. He had just got this airplane, and I was transferred onto it. And it was the first silver airplane that came into the European theater of operations that we knew of. Mm -hmm. And once he asked for the princess to christen it, the, 
the king decided he did not want it named Princess Elizabeth because of going down, so he named it the Rosa York because when he was Duke of York, she was born and he called her his little rose. Yeah. Now, um, who who decided that, well, first of all, that they wanted to name it the Princess Elizabeth? Yeah. Was it the pilot of the plane or what? No, it was, a, it was the uh, ground engineer. Mm -hmm. and, and he was, your ground engineer is a guy that you have all the faith in. He's the guy that takes care of your airplane. When it's on the ground, he is it. Right. And he was yeah. uh, Sergeant Gregory. It's his plane, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that was his idea then. And then they, yeah. And he's the one who went ahead and contacted the Queen and General Doolittle and the rest of them regarding the christening of the airplane. And, um, and um, I know we've got some photographs here that you showed me before about uh, the princess and the king and queen actually yeah. did come for oh, yeah. the christening. Is oh, that yeah. correct? She was 18 years old. It was on her 18th yeah. birthday. A couple days before D-Day. Oh, it was on her yeah. 18th birthday. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah she... And um, I know there's a picture of uh, we have of her uh, just getting ready to, to talk to you, I believe. Do you, do you remember much about that? Yeah, I can remember the, the one picture that Bill has. It was when we made another, we went to another base to make another oh, film. Yeah. But but this, she came she yeah. came to our, through our line and I was a tail gunner and she had came to the line too fast for the Fox movie town was, tone was making a newsreel of it. Mm -hmm. So he said, would you, stop and talk to Sergeant Vaughn, so she was as bashful as I was, and she did ask me, would you please send us a letter after every mission to let us know how the airplane came through, and she did, and we, we Sergeant Gregory sent her a letter, and she answered every letter that I knew of, and that was about eight or ten, I guess, and uh, you know, I said we had a hard time conversing because she was as bashful as I was. Um, she asked me naturally where I was from in the States, and where I went to school and how old I was and stuff like that. And I suppose it, it was a minute and a half that she, but I know Fox Movie took a film of it and it was on the news back in 1943. Hmm. Uh, my, my aunt had seen it in Chicago on the news, but I never ever, I was like everybody else, I didn't want anything to do with the Air Force or Army once I got out, so I never followed up on yeah. anything. Well, maybe we can see if we can track that down, that would be quite interesting. But in, in this picture that we have here is that Doolittle decided that with the king and queen that they wanted to meet us after a mission. They wanted to, it to be that we would come back in with our flying clothes and everything on and they would meet us. And so they made us go back to the barracks, put our flying clothes on. We got in our airplane, took off, went to another base about five miles away called Molesworth. And as we landed, they came in in the brigade and came out to our airplane and went through the lane again and met us all. And this is where she's talking to me at the end yeah. again. And uh, that's do a little there with her, bring her through the line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty special. My clothes for is Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so that. Was that before any missions had been flown with uh, the... Oh no, the we had already to... flown. When we got the airplane, it didn't have any name on it at all. Oh, okay. And we flew two missions with it without a name. And then we flew, I think, two missions with the Rosie York. I mean, with the Princess Elizabeth, and, we, and then went to Rosie York. I was on my sixth mission, and, and I think I flew 23 or 24, I'm not sure. And uh, it was still flying. and. and other crews came in and took it over. As it seemed like, even of the let's see, six to twenty-four, say the eighteen missions I flew on her, we had quite a change in crews because that crew was made up. They just brought them in and put them in. And some had eight missions, some had fifteen, some had twenty-two. I had two different pilots, two different navigators, two different bombardiers, two different radio men, two different engineers, two different ball turret gunners. Did you have a favorite pilot of the ones that you flew? With? Yes, uh, our, our, my original pilot. Uh, his name was um, Captain Raster, wasn't it? Raster. And um, he's, he was the one that was, that was taking her through the line a lot. He was, um, uh, he was a Mormon. He was from Ogden, Utah, I can always remember. And the co-pilot was McDonough, who then became the lead pilot when Raster finished. And they were both excellent. 
And you had 25 missions to fly at that time? No, we had, at that time, we had a 35. We, oh. we had 25 when I first went over there, and if you got so many missions in, they raised it from 25 to 30, so they'd give you a mission. Then we got to 28 or 29, they gave us another mission because they raised it to 35. But I didn't, I didn't fly that many missions because, I guess it, because of my tenure, I would have been over there 11 months pretty well, so they decided that was long enough I could come home. And I didn't even know I was coming home. Never, nobody ever said a word to me. I went down one morning to operations, and the operations officer says, you're all through flying Watson Vaughn. He says, you're going home. And I couldn't believe it. Um, does the longer you're there, the more the pressure builds, and, and or, or do you feel I, like you, I, I the longer you, you think, adjust to it better, no. or, or what? I don't think I did. I think once I got on a regular crew, as we as we were, that I adjusted much more to it. I think the first six, seven, eight missions where we flew with other people we didn't know, uh, you were much more frustrated, and you came down, you didn't know anybody, you know. But you become a, you become very close as a crew, and you feel like you can depend on each other. Oh and yeah, stuff like that. oh yeah, oh yeah. We would it's closer than brothers. Yeah, and I mean, that's what always amazes me. I mean, guys from all different walks of life, yeah. from all over, yeah. and come together and yeah. as one, yeah. so to speak. That's true. You know, you're you become very close. We got, as I say, even the, even the crew that we, we trained with in the States, we, we all got split up. But even when we were training in the States, we were very close-knit. I mean, if mm -hmm. nobody would go any place without the other guy. You were always together. And, and this crew, the, these these officers would come down to our barracks and, and have breakfast with us guys if we was making breakfast or something. That's how close. In other words, you don't see that in service, you know. And um, the training that you had, did that help as oh, yes. far as, I mean, oh, it yes. seems like it, guys just, you just do things automatically because you have done it so much. Well, I think I, you do you do after you've been trained to do it automatically. Uh, I mean, I, I had no idea what a 50 caliber gun was. I never knew how, how, how much you had a, how much a, a bullet dropped at 200 yards or 100 yards, how much you had to lead an airplane because of speed in that. But that training all paid off. And uh, that's what you did when you were in training was to, you had you had that second or two to figure out what that plane was doing, how fast, and uh, how much you had to lead them because there's a lot of drop, a lot of ballistics in air to air fire compared to ground to air fire. Your 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 projectiles drop so bad. I think at like three three hundred yards you probably drop seven eight feet. You know, like if I remember right, I mean, which you're firing up there, it's something down here, and you just hope it's going on. Did you ever get credit for? Uh, no, I never that? did. I, and once I got to be a lead gunner, I didn't have a chance because I always had you know, 17 planes behind me all the time. Like once I got on the lead airplane, which was the Rosie Ark, we only then became we were just squadron leader, group leader, wing leader, Eighth Air Force leader. And were they bombing off of you? Yes. By this time. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's it's an, it's a good question because a lot of people don't realize there's only two bombs out of out of 18 airplanes that's up there in in a in a, in a wing. I mean, in the group, there's only two of you that have bomb sites. Us and the number two guy that flew beside us. And as we dropped, our first drop was a smoke bomb. And then everybody would drop either on a 1,001 count or 1,002 count or 1,003 count. It was a dispersion, basically dispersion, a bombing. Of you. you weren't pinpoint bombing. But if our pilot was fairly accurate, I mean, our, our bombardier was fairly accurate, then the rest of them would be. What were some of uh, the places that you went that uh, stand out in your mind? So well, said. we were the first ones to Berlin, uh, but Berlin wasn't as tough as Hamburg, Germany. It was the worst place we bombed. Uh, my last mission, we got hit and lost an engine. Uh, we went to Pina Mundi, which is the home of the robot bomb that was way up in the northeast yeah. part of the country. And uh, we came back on three motors and dropped our bombs in some farmer's wheat field and aimed at a bridge, but I'm sure we did more damage to his wheat field than the bridge, and came back by herself, and uh, that was my last mission. We were only 25 minutes from Sweden, and I wanted to go to Sweden, but the pilot wasn't finishing, and he said, let's go back. And, <laughs> um, yeah. That had to be, uh, any, fi no, any fighters, uh, escorts, 
We didn't. Did we didn't. Come back by no, ourselves? when we came back by ourselves, we went down to probably 1,500 feet above the water, and we just flew above the water all the way back, and probably total airspeed of 115, 20 mile an hour. We couldn't feather the prop, and the prop was just like riding in the car with a flat tire. Which is it windmilling? And yeah, just coming. windmills, and it, your plane will just go like that. And he made me stay in the tail because of, of fighters and. Now, did you have to get over the, the cliffs of Dover when you got back? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But you had enough. Uh, yeah, we, 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 up we were up high enough, yeah. We could, uh, it, it's amazing yeah. that at 17, the three motors, you could do about anything you could afford, it just took it a little longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great airplane. Yeah. And uh, anybody get hurt on your crew on any of your missions? Yeah, we were, and I can't remember the man's name, he was flying observer force. Can't remember the name. I can't even. I definitely. I don't even remember the mission. But he got hit with flak. He didn't get killed. He got hit with flak and got hurt, but he didn't get killed. No, nobody ever got killed on my airplane. Uh, and he was the only man I know that got hit. And uh, even going through the crash landing as we did, we had very little. Nobody got hurt bad. The um, we and, and the flak. Uh, tell us a little bit about. Where people might not know what flak is. Actually. Flak uh, is when they're shooting you at you from the ground, and as it comes up in the air, it bursts. Um, and uh, they their main guns was was 88 millimeters. Uh, that was one of their best known guns. And the 88 millimeter would come up to about 22, 23 thousand feet. And if it exploded near you or around you, even if it didn't hit you, it would throw your airplane maybe five feet one way or five feet another way. It would just be like hitting an air pocket and you would just jump. And uh, if it hit you, it would sound like if you were inside of a garbage can and somebody was trying to cut through it with an ax, that's about what it sounded like. And uh, um, the worst one I ever had was, I think we were over Mercyburg, which is in the Ruhr Valley, and I had the uh, horizontal stabilizer all shot off except the four feet of it. And I was lucky I never even got a scratch out of it. Oh, that's just right yeah. above your head, right? Yeah. And we came back, uh, led the group back all the way with that, and landed and had no problem. Mm. Um, and the other, it, even if you don't get a direct hit, but if you say knock out an engine or you got to fall back out of the uh, your group, yeah. that's when you're vulnerable to yeah, the, very to vulnerable the, to and, the, and the uh, fighters. The first thing you do is go right down to the ground, so that's and you, uh, you try to just hedge hop back because. Of, they couldn't dive on you too bad, and you were just hoping that you'd miss any aircraft that they might have on the ground. And we were pretty well uh, briefed on where all aircraft was, I mean, uh, aircraft guns, <clears throat> except they had a lot of guns on railroad tracks where they would move them, and we wouldn't know if they were gonna be here today and up there tomorrow. And uh, I went to all the briefings. Once I got on the lead airplane, I went to all the briefings with the pilot and the navigators, and. Uh, I was the only enlisted man in there, and my job as a tail gunner on a lead airplane was just to keep that formation together. Don't let them spread apart. If if the number six man in the low squadron was getting out, she would call the pilot and tell them to get them back in or whatever. It was. Up until that time, they always flew bombardiers or navigators in the lead airplane tail, but they ran out of them, and I was lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time and got in. From then on, it was just enlisted men. Let's talk about that. Um Briefing, you see it in the movies and stuff. You know that uh, they're like in a Quonset hut, and everybody's sitting there, and they pull the curtain back, and that's the big map. Is that, is that kind of the way that it was? Yes, it was. It was. Uh, it was a room. Probably they could sit. Um, I'm. I'm saying. I'm just guessing right now. I'm saying they could put 80 people in there, and they had a big map up there, and a man by the name of Dinwiddie Furmeister was our operations officer, and he would be up there, and there'd be a map of. Say it was it would be a blown up map of say Berlin or Hamburg or Little France or Paris, and they would they would draw you. It was all drawn lines of, of your route. I mean you, when when you flew an airplane at say for instance Berlin, you might go past Berlin 30 40 seconds, and then you would hit what they call an IP point, which is the initial point. Then you turn right around, come back and bomb them. You would try to divert their them from thinking that you were going to bomb them, so you would go past it, but then you'd come back and hit them, and that was always, uh, once you hit the IP point, 
especially in a lead airplane like I was. The bombardier then flies that airplane from the IP point to the target. He can steer the whole airplane with that, with that, air, with that bomb sight. And uh, we were just us and the number two men were the only ones that had bomb sights in our airplanes. And when you were when he's doing that, you there was you couldn't try and evade the flak, which you probably could no, anyway. You no, just he, had to just go straight. That's right. Once he got on it, uh, yeah, he would say, he would say we're not we're now headed at the target, and he'd say twenty five seconds, twenty four seconds, twenty three, and he'd count it down to one, and then bombs away. And. Uh, now, when you when you when bombs away, you can just feel your airplane go up in the air like that, about two or three feet from the weight of of the bombs going. You would just jump up like that. Um, well, a couple of things. Your base, where was where was that? What was the name of your base again? Our base was called Thurlai. Thurlai was the name of it, and we were about five miles out of a town called Bedford, which was a town of about a quarter of a million population, northeast of London, about. 60 miles. Uh, it, was a plant, it was a town that was, uh, had two big ammunition factories and I can remember that. There was four bases around this town and three of those bases was in the same combat wing. It takes three bases to form a combat wing and three of them were, we were all in the same wing and we were the oldest combat wing in, in uh, England. We were the oldest ones that started and we were still operational. I know, um, I know when you dropped your bombs, um, there are probably people being killed down there. Oh, yeah. did, did that ever bother you? Or what no, your feelings about no. That? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about it. I, in fact, I, I'll, I'll just repeat this. I have never told many people, but uh, I think it was probably my fourth mission. We were we were going to bomb Frankfurt, and Frankfurt had a lot of air bases around it. We were after an airfield. And, and there's a briefing officer says, well, he says, we're going to bomb today. Our bombs will be going out at 12.01 German time. And he says, the air base is, we're, we're going to have zero weather. So he said, our main object is to fly down the main street of Frankfurt. And we did. And, uh, Why uh, noon? Huh? Why 12 o'clock? Because that's when everybody got out of work. Everybody would be out in the streets or leaving the buildings. There was a, I didn't finish it, there was a English columnist down there. And he wrote an article in the Stars and Stripes about the massacre that we caused that day in Frankfurt. But it's, it didn't bother you at the time. You know, I, there's one thing great about the Air Force over the rest of them is we didn't see the atrocities. We didn't see the killings. And um, it was just there of losing your friends. And then the other thing I wanted to ask, um, you probably had a lot of bad weather around your own base and everything oh, yeah. when you went up most of the time. It, it, it's amazing to me that there were not more mid-air collisions yeah. with so many B-17s coming up from all that That's small right. area yeah. of, of that island. I mean, yeah, that the, has to... Pe yeah, people don't realize that. And, and <clears throat> it was like once I got on the lead airplane, my job once we took off was to shoot flares. And say today our colors were green and yellow. And what and what time would you usually take? I, off? I would wait until I get up at about five thousand feet. But I mean, what time of the day? It would be early. It'd be oh yeah. Before the sun we would came start. Up. We'd probably go into breakfast at four, go into briefing at five, and maybe take off at seven, six thirty-seven. Uh, then, if we were say leading the wing in today, which is a pretty big job, we would take off. And we'd go up in the area and I'd start shooting these flares. And they all knew what, what color our flare was and where they had to form on us. And when you start getting all the different combat wings, there would be probably, I'm talking now, we're talking of probably 500, 700 airplanes uh, f falling together, trying to get there. We might be flying up there for an hour and a half in England before we even take off because we're trying to get everybody in, in formation because we knew if we didn't fly formation, we were dead ducks. We had to stay together, and that's why it took us so long. A lot of our missions were anywhere from eight to 11 hours, and we'd only, it'd only take us two hours to go in and two hours to come back out, but the rest of the time we were either forming or, or waiting to get back down on the ground again. Imagine bringing 3,000 airplanes back and all trying to land. It. You're probably out of your base. You've probably got, on run, one runway, you probably got um, 54 airplanes trying to land. So 
but it takes a while. So it was a surprise to you when you found out you were coming home? Yes, a very surprised because I went I went down to the operation office at, at meeting at one o'clock. We had one at eight o'clock and one at one o'clock and at eight o'clock they didn't say anything to me and at one o'clock we just went down there to more or less check in and this major came up to me and he says, Watson Vaughn, he says, You're not flying anymore. He says, You're going home and I couldn't believe it. Okay, before we bring you home, Bill, do you have anything you wanna add uh, to this uh, about this time over there? Any questions you would want to? No, not really. I'm, other than when you were flying, and you were flying lead, you didn't fly. Did you fly every day when you flew the lead, or how did they work that? If you like, like you have you have four squadrons to a group, as you know that we, we were the 367, the 368, 369, 423. Today we we flew because we were leading that group, and then we wouldn't fly for the next four missions because the next day 368 would lead, 369 would lead, then 423, then unless they would fly a double mission in the day, and we only did that at D-Day, is the only time I can ever remember of anybody in our outfit ever flying two missions because it was so short. But if you got bad weather, we might fly only six days, and we might fly eight days. That was one thing about being on the lead. Some of our crews would go up 25, 26 days in a row, and they would be completely flak happy. Did you ever, I remember they talked about the flak houses, R&R, &R. did you go yeah. to any of those? Yes, I did. I, I got sent to, uh, I think it was on my probably 16th, 17th mission, they gave me what they call a flak leave. And you had several places you could go. We, we happened to choose Scotland. We went up to Scotland at Edinburgh. And I, I spent, I think we spent six days at Edinburgh. And uh, it was something that you needed, I think. And pretty much there, they you just relax and yeah, just did just almost drink. anything you, you wanted. You tried to drink Scotland dry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did you go on leave in the London any or much? Yes, and that was what was great about being on the lead airplane. Is I knew if I flew today, I wasn't going to have to be here tomorrow or next day. So we'd jump on a plane and a train and go to, to London, which was only about an hour and a half away. And uh, I don't know if, if you everybody had ever told you the story, but the, but the English trains, they just have compartments about like this, and there's, there's a row sitting here, and there's a row sitting here, and you face each other, and there's no conductors, nobody ever gets in that airport. So if you go to sleep, and your, your, your train stops at the station, you're supposed to get off, and nobody wakes you up, you just keep on the train. Well, that happened to I and my ball turret gunner, and we ended up in Cambridge, which was about 80 miles away, and decided at the time we were there, we might as well see Cambridge University, so we stayed there a day or two, and but when we got back to base, they caught us as we came in, and we both got busted at the time. And, <laughs> and, uh, but I did get to see Cambridge. And in London, um, would you go to shows or um, clubs? Or you know, I, I, can, I can remember, no, I don't remember going to shows. I remember drinking and dancing. I think that was the big thing. So it was dancing and dancing and dancing. And, and were the buzz bombs coming in? Yeah, they were dancing? coming in toward the end of my tenure. I can remember being in, in, in London and hearing them come, and they always said, you know, as long as you hear them, don't worry. It's when they stop, when you don't hear the noise, you get the hell out of the way, and and you could hear them come. They'd come in, they make quite a bit of noise. Surprising, they make quite a bit of noise, and we could hear them coming and went over us and eventually dropped someplace, but people that never got to London don't realize the damage that they took from from the bombing. It was It was horrific. But they were very tough people. Yeah. And it's amazing, their subways were working most all the time I was over there. We would go down the subway and go from one end to the other. But uh, awful lot of, awful, a lot of parts of London was completely, completely devastated. There was nothing left of it. And were the Germans uh, um, strafing your air, aerodrome at all? Did you ever have any? No, we, it, it was amazing that we, and as I say, there was four bases around this town of Bedford, and uh, which had ammunition factories, which you know, you'd know you think they'd want to knock out. And I think I only heard the Germans over our area probably half a dozen times. Never saw them drop a bomb on us. Never saw an airplane per se, because it was, they always did it at night. Uh, they never bombed in the daytime. See, we would bomb at daytime, and the British would bomb at night. Right. 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 Um, yeah. I'm just about. I 
just about out of tape here, so okay. let's this time to take a break, and I'll change uh, change here for us. Doing okay? Yeah, I'm sorry I broke down. No, I never, no, no, never no, mind. It's okay. Day yeah, would I ever think I'd break down? It's all right. Here, oh. after a little more water for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, I told Billy when he came over there at night and said, "Well, he'd, he'd sent this up and everything." And I, I said, "I woke up at 3:30 this morning, and I, I, I remember the time I left Prescott, Maine, until I finished my missions and came home. I flew every one of them. But I, you know, you, it's been so many years that you, you just never think of it. Uh, I never kept in contact with uh, with my group or any of my people that I flew with." Uh, I tried to find a couple of them when I got back to the States, but never was successful. But, uh, well, what is done? They got down, but they did get over to Switzerland. They stayed in Switzerland the whole war. So they were a hell of a lot better off than I was. Did you fly out on Black Thursday? Well, we're not on the interview right now. <coughs> Swineford? Yeah, 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 we are. Okay, yeah. I, I, I went on the Swineford run, yes. Uh, Reagan's very Yeah, I went on. We, we, we did, after we knocked out the airfields down around Frankfurt and Augsburg uh, and several other places, then we, we spent most of our time on the Ruhr Valley, which was a manufacturing center of Germany, the ball bearing factories and, and all of that. And Mercyburg, that's, that was the mission and I got the, the, the stabilizer shot off the airplane. And, um, they were tracking us. We, I could follow that gun down below, tracking us all the way until we finally got it hit on it. And I, I kept telling the pilot, but he couldn't go evasive action because we were leading the, the group in there and mm -hmm. you can't do evasive action with 17 planes behind you, you know. So he just hopes that the son of a gun runs out of ammunition. But uh, the scary things are uh, the flak. We always felt we could defend ourselves against the fighters, but you had no defense against the flak. And when you saw it coming, uh, thank God I was in the tail. I could see where we were. But if I was sitting up in front and had to see all the black bursting ahead of us and know we had to go through it, you know, I'm sure it would have affected me a lot worse. But as we got through it, I looked back and wonder how in the hell you get through it, you know, because it's just it's just a black cloud from just from explosions of, of ammunition. Did you see other V-17s uh, oh, blow saw, up or I saw, like yeah, that? many, many. Um, so how did you get back home then? Well, they, uh, after he told me I was through, I, I laid around England for about a month, and then I, they finally sent me up to Liverpool and put me on a, on, a, on a boat called the New Amsterdam. And this would have been what month then? This was in, let's see, I got home in October. This had to be in, oh, I got home in October. This had to be in October, around the first part of October. Because 40, 43? Uh, in, in, 40, in 44. 44. In 44. Yeah, because yeah. we came home on the New Amsterdam and we landed in Boston, and then they put us on troop trains at Boston and brought us all over the United States. So it was the largest contingent of gunners had ever come home at one time. There was only 5,000 of us on the whole boat. Not all gunners, there was a lot of wounded people on it. But uh, they would let, like we get to New York, they'd let <clears throat> 15 cars go south into the deep south and 15 cars in the Midwest and 10 cars on the West Coast. And we just happened to be one of the West Coast. We went out through Chicago, Minneapolis and came home. But I think it took us a week to, before we got home on the troop train. And uh, then I was, I was through combat. So what did you, what, what did you, what did they have you do? Then uh, they gave me, a, they gave me a leave and I got married four days after I got home to a okay. gal that I had been corresponding with and it went with a little bit when I was younger, but never serious, but we got married and had a good marriage. But what went back her, what, to, what, what's her name? Germaine. Her name is Germaine, Germaine Becker. And um, so where did you meet her? I met her in, I was going to say Wynonna, Minnesota, but it was Yes, it was. It was. I met her in Wyoming, Minnesota. That's okay. where I met her. Yeah. And so you corresponded all during. The we war? kept corresponding during the war. Never really went together. And oh. when I came home, she was out in Seattle working at Boeing. And four days later, we she said I do, and we got married. And uh, yes. it was a very great marriage. Okay. I lost her many years ago, but. 
Um, did you have any children? Yeah, I had two daughters. And what are their names? Paulette is, is my oldest daughter. She's living, and um, my youngest daughter, Michelle, got killed in a car accident. What's wrong with me? In 1985. How old was she then? Uh, 34, 34, 35, something like that, yeah. She and her daughter got killed. Do you have any other grandchildren? I have, um, yeah, the one, of uh, the daughter that got killed, the, her youngest lived through it. And she's now 24, I think. She was about uh, two years old. And where does she live? She lives, she was raised by my other daughter, and now she lives up in Washington, in Whidbey Island, up in the Washington area, where yeah, my what's, daughter What's her name? Uh, Piper, Piper Travis. And then I have a granddaughter by the name of uh, Tamara. Uh, her, her, her name was Beck, and now it's uh, Tamara Caples. And she has two granddaughters, so I had no boys in my family. They were all, they were all girls, and I said God knew what he was doing, because if I'd been a boy and wouldn't have been an athlete, I would have. Because <laughs> I was an athlete all the way through school and college. And yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you got, you got married, and um, and then wh where were you stationed at then? I was, uh, when I got married, I was, I was uh, I didn't have a station. I, I was just on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a travel leave, and I went from home to Santa Monica where they gave us a 10-day flak leave down there, and then mm -hmm. from there back to Denver, Colorado again. My wife got pregnant in Denver and she went home and I went down to Wichita Falls in Texas and was there for five, six months and from there up to Amarillo, Texas, was there two or three months and I got Were they having you training other guys or what? No, I, I played baseball. I played oh, okay. baseball all the time and then I was a physical a PE instructor. Uh, they didn't know what to do with us because they had so many of us around. and. Uh, I enjoyed PE instructing, but I played baseball six what, nights a week. What position did you play? I was a pitcher and a center fielder. I oh, played the two. Is positions. that what you did in high school too? Your yeah, positions? I did mostly pitching in high school at the University of Washington, and I pitched and, and played outfield. And, oh. You're uh, right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Yeah. Played a, played a lot of semi-pro ball. Have a good fastball. Yeah, yeah, good fastball. <laughs> Had a good knockdown pitch like this. <laughs> <laughs> Little chin music, please. Um, so, and then, uh, so when did you get out of the service? Sir? I got out of the service in, um, got to stop and think real sharp here, uh, October 6th, 1945. Okay. And, yeah, and, October. and what did you do then when you got out? I hitchhiked home from Amarillo, Texas to Seattle, believe it or not. And then uh, I started out just working. Now, was your father... In out, out then, out by there? that time, my folks had moved to Seattle. Yes, yeah. they had both, all, and my family had all lived, was all living in Seattle. What about all your brothers and sisters and everybody? They were all well. I had one, one brother that was had just got home ahead of me. He had been wounded in in, in the army, and then another brother that got home just after me. And uh, he got wounded. He also got wounded in the army. Where were those guys? Where they were, were both in in France. One of them got in France, and one in in Germany. And my oldest brother, Bill's dad, was in the Navy. He was only in about eight months, but he was home, I think, by the time I got home, because he had a family. Then I had a brother-in-law that was in there at the same time. He was he was in Pearl Harbor when that happened. And so we got home, and I and I got home, and I got discharged. Uh, I was I got discharged October sixth of, of, of forty-five, and went home and worked a few years, and then decided to go to the University of Washington. Went there for four years, and five years. Okay, and uh, then became a contractor. Oh, you did. <laughs> uh, when did you start at uh, UW? In 1948. I went from 48 until the summer of 52. Uh, I had married and had a family by the time. I had right. two children by the time. Yeah. And what was your major? I was a coach, physical education. Yeah. And you played played ball at yeah, uh, played, Washington. Yeah, yeah, played baseball and did a lot of intramural sports. I was married and had two kids, and I didn't have much time for anything else. Go to school. When you were a kid, uh, I meant to ask you too, did you have favorite teams? Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubbies. See, I did, we didn't have a radio until I was about 11 years old. Uh -huh. That was the first radio up in our neck of the woods. And the only station I could get was WCCO in Chicago, and they were the Chicago Cubs at that time. Still my favorite team. Yeah, it's 
kind of like me. I was Southern Indiana and oh. St. Louis Cardinals. So oh, yeah. Two, we got Harry Carey. And yeah. Oh, my gosh. Guys. And no then he went to Chicago. And oh, really? Up, the Dean. Well, I can go back. I can, I can go back and name you all of the great St. Louis players. The Deans. And the yeah, players. Well, that's okay. I think, uh, didn't Dizzy end up with the Cubs? I that's think, right. He did. He did. Yeah. That, that's all right. I'll get it. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's all right. That's just what we had. When we want to get it. Yeah. yeah. So who were some of your favorite Cubbies? Well, gosh, and I go way back, you know, uh, uh, Gabby Hartnett is, I don't know if you remember that, oh, yeah, yeah. back mm -hmm. Lon Warnick, he was a great player. The Hack, Stan Hack, and Billy Herman, and Phil Cavaretta, and Bill Nichols, I can name them all. Yeah. I haven't heard Ernie Banks Bill yet. Nicholson. Oh, this oh, is this is way oh, before yeah, Ernie yeah, Banks. Yeah. He's, he's back in the real, yeah. real Cubs. Yeah, I'm, I'm back with, with when I'm talking about him. He had the Dean boys and the Medwicks. And the, right. I'm yeah. younger, excuse me. Yes. Uh, I, I've oh, always yeah. been a very avid yes. uh, baseball player. Hack was third base, right? That's right. Hartnett was the catcher. That's right. right. Herman, Phil, was, Herman was second base. Billy right. Jurgis was shortstop. Was uh, Phil Cabaretta? First base. Yeah, first, first base. base. Yeah. Right. Bill Nicholson was right field. Uh, Andy Pafko, I remember. Left field, a bit left field, great yeah. player. Yeah. Yeah. Center field, who was it? Pap well, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That's the way I am with, I, I, and even St. Louis, because St. Louis was a, kind of a favorite team of mine, too, because yeah. they were a good team. They were an interesting ball club. Yeah, but, but in those days, there were like eight teams in each league, and That's so, right. I mean, when you're a kid, I mean, you, you know every player on every team, exactly. and you can, you know, just, uh, I made a, had a, we made up a little game, a little spinner game, and we had the all-stars from each team and just had the names and just played just hours and hours on end, you know. Just yeah. yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't have a lot in those days for entertainment. Yeah, and, yeah, and the, the, listen to the radio, yeah. and you yeah. can visualize things yeah. where TV, you're just showing it. You That's know, right. It's just yeah. a big... Yeah. 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 yeah, I was 19 before we had electric lights in the home, and Never did ever have a telephone. Do you remember some of your favorite radio shows when you were a kid? Uh, you know, I don't. You know, I, I don't, and I'm sure I did, but I don't remember no, listening to a lot of radio shows. I don't know mm -hmm. why, but I don't. Uh, no, I'd say no. I don't, yeah. I don't know. So you would, well, you'd listen to the Cubs on the radio, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. yeah. The Cubs in Minneapolis, Minneapolis Millers. Mm -hmm. They were in American Association. Right. Were they, uh, who, they were a farm club of who? Minneapolis, do you know? I can I can I can I can tell you the announcer of the ball. His name was Halsey Hall. Do you remember that name? Yeah, I do remember that name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I was from Evansville, Indiana. And we had oh. Class B, and we were yeah. the Braves, and Milwaukee Braves were in. Oh, the, were they in the, that American Association? Oh, for Minneapolis. Yeah. yeah. After they came from Boston over to Milwaukee. Well, no, this was when they were. Uh, this was in the association. Oh, before. this is okay. this is not. Yeah, they okay. were even called American the, Association. Yeah. Uh, no, they were called the, uh, I'm sorry, the Milwaukee Brewers. That's Brewers. what they, they were called, yeah. But they were a farm club of the Braves. Yeah, that's right. Like, uh, you know, Toledo, Indianapolis, Indianapolis, St. Paul, mm -hmm. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Those were all in the association. Yeah. And in those days, I mean, this is double A ball, yeah. and, or triple A, triple A, I guess. AAA. I mean, triple A, and they were probably better players that are in the major leagues right now. Yeah. I mean, they had stacked up. Yeah. I mean, of course, you only had 16 teams. You That's know, right. And it wasn't diluted down. Yeah. Like yeah. You're, you're right. exactly right, Dave. Because I, I follow baseball very, very close, but you're, you're hitting it right on the head. There were probably more great players that didn't even get a chance to play in the big leagues in those days than there are in the big leagues today. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, and when you got married, where did you live uh, while you were going to to school there? I lived in Seattle, and I went to the University of Washington, which is right in Seattle. And uh, did you had you bought a home by this time, or were you renting? Or um, I think I was renting the first few years, and we then I bought a home. And uh, Do you remember we, the street? You uh, yeah, I can remember. We lived on six six Northwest and Ninetieth in Seattle, which is in the northwest part of town, and uh, lived there and uh, went through school. And did you? Where did you grow up, Bill? In Seattle? Yeah, he grew up. Why don't you go over there? Watt has followed. Okay, we'll go on over. My little career. All right, that's yeah, one Since birth. He was there when I was born. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, did you guys live pretty close to each other? Very close. We were probably not more than. 
couple miles away because about that. Oh yeah. wait a minute, yeah, because about that time I think we were living in. Uh, you were living in Motley, Motley Terrace. Motley, well, we were out there at that time when you had the little house on 90th. Yeah, yeah. I, I then I remember oh, you. Moved, then you Edmonds. moved out. Then you moved out to Edmonds. So then you're about four miles, five miles away from us. Right. Yeah. That was after we left the yeah. the old station mm -hmm. here. Yeah. What did your dad do, Bill? I beg your pardon. What did your father do? My father said? was a. Uh, he ran a service station, kind of a, as a and a mechanic, mm -hmm. and uh, but, uh, we set up one of the first used. Actually, it was a parking lot sort of a situation. I remember during the Second World War, he would uh, park cars out in the station lot because for the for the football games at the University of Washington. Because we oh. lived right three or four blocks from the University of Washington at that time. I think it was one of the first parking lot they ever had. Right, yeah. and they set up a little used car. Uh, dealing, I think it was one of the first used car things. Yeah. <laughs> did a few other things too, like. <laughs> what kind of gas did they pump? Did you pump then? Did you, you remember? It was regular, you know, uh, oh, gas, the name of the signal. Yeah. Yeah. signal yeah. Service I didn't station. remember that. Remember oh, signal. I remember that place well a lot. <laughs> and uh, then he went, he joined, he, he, he was drafted into the Navy. Mm -hmm. And he went over, he was in the Pacific and ended up in the Philippines. And didn't have to stay in long because he had four kids, and his point the point system then was, you know, designed to people who had responsibilities. The more responsibility you had, the quicker you got out of the service. So he came home quite soon, but he he didn't like what he saw over there. A lot of a lot of dead Japanese laying around. A lot of dead people. Just what kind of ship was he on? He was on a, a communication ship, mm -hmm. and they're usually pretty good targets. <laughs> for for the enemy. Yeah. Okay. What well, uh, after you graduated, then did you go into contracting right away, or did you? What you do? Yeah. As soon as I I, uh, I went to work as a con with a contracting group and uh, became a superintendent with them for after about a year, then worked for them about three years, and I and two other guys formed our own group. And, and had we, you worked construction like before you while you no, went through school or anything no, like I that? How, how did you end up? When I went through school, boy, I, mean, I can tell you, I can tell you my my years. You wouldn't yeah. remember my hours. You won't believe it. I'd get up at five thirty in the morning, go downtown under the biggest parking garage. I'd open up the parking garage and and uh, and do the washing and, and uh, at least the wash rack and simonize rack out. And nine o'clock, I'd run from there and go out to school and go to school until three or four o'clock. And if I was playing ball, it'd be a little later and go back and work another hour or two and. Then when the baseball team was in town, I'd go out to the ballpark and work from 6.30 to midnight. <laughs> I did that for two years and got ulcers very bad and and uh, eventually uh, got smart enough that I had to, I had to start doing something else. And I now, they, they had a AAA Pacific Coast yes, team. Yes, that's was right. It, were they called the Pilots then? No, mm -hmm. they were called uh, the Rainiers. Rainiers. The Rainiers. Oh. Seattle Rainiers. Oh, that was Oakland. Was it Oakland Rainiers? Or no, Seattle? the Seattle Rainiers, Rainiers and then the Oakland uh, our San Francisco so Seals, Seals, Oakland, and then it was there was San Diego, Acorns, Acorns, yeah, and, that's and, right, and was. L.A. and uh, Sacramento, yeah, and Hollywood, Hollywood and uh, Hollywood Stars. Yeah, they were AAA, yeah. just like the association. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And I worked at the ballpark. I worked out in the parking lot, parking the cars, helping them, showing them where to go. And, and uh, do you remember some of the good players uh, coming up through there? Uh, you know. Naturally, Fred Hutchinson was probably the, the greatest player that came up through there. Uh, uh, when I when I look back at the great players, there were some of them that came up to the big leagues, but the, they were never the name that the Hutchinson Wells, uh, Santo, Ron Santo Ron played Santa. for the Cubs yeah. for a number of years. Uh, was up there, and but uh, they had some good teams down in there, but uh, nothing that nobody really shined like those two probably. Now, when you were um, Playing, um, 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 would you play like city leagues or things like that when you? Yeah, were? I, I I played city ball for about oh gosh twenty years. Any probably. good players come through there that you played against or with? No, I think any of them that I can remember them probably got up to B ball or something mm -hmm. like that, and uh, but that was about all. Uh, yeah. And so. Um, well, okay, tell me about your career, your construction career then. My what? Your career in construction. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't a general contractor. What I what contractor. my main line of work was I would take the old buildings, brick buildings, masonry buildings, and restore them back to original. In other words, the 
the West Coast was built back in the 1850s and 40s, and the mortar joints would start deteriorating out, and they'd start leaking all the way through. So we would go in and cut these joints out, put new mortar joints in, put new units in if they were bad, the bricks or terracotta or whatever, uh, clean the building and uh, paint it and waterproof it and make it look like it was brand new in the 1850. It was a real challenge because uh, in those days, most all the masonry that was used on the West Coast were, was ballast out of ships that came from China, Japan, India, whatever, to pick up whatever here. And they built these buildings out of those masonry units. And of course, they were different colors and different sizes, so we had to make our own units to, to be able to replace them. And some of these buildings, we'd place as high as five, 6,000 units into a building. It was very interesting business. It was starting with, with nothing and finishing with a job that it looked like the day it was built. And we worked about seven states, a couple of provinces. And, yeah. you know. and I might add that had it not been for Watson, there would have been a lot of his brothers and brothers-in-law who would have had to find other endeavors. He, he, I can't say supported, but it was him who was instrumental. And all happen. his brothers and all his, and I, as well as some of his nephews, worked for his company, and some of these people branched out and formed companies of their own. But it was Watt who took care of us all. Watt was the one we went to get a job from. It was Watt. Yeah, a long time ago. And it was. And I sold out in uh, 1981, I retired. January of 81, I retired. And I always say that's the greatest thing God invented was retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great I play great. a lot of golf. Yeah. I still enjoy a lot of golf. I still play a lot of golf. And uh, did you? Did you play golf uh, besides baseball and stuff like that? No, I didn't, I didn't, play, I didn't golf. play golf until after I completely retired. I just oh, didn't have didn't. time for it, and then, then I've, I've made up for it. I've, and where do you usually play? I, I belong to Mission Hills Country Club out here for 22 years, and uh, I live at a little place called Date Palm Country Club, which is an executive course, and right. I, I belong to Santa Rosa Country Club yet. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we live, I live at, Mission, we live at Mission Hills. Oh, you don't? Yeah, oh, great place. Yeah. Great yeah. college. Best complex in the desert. Now, do you live here all the time, or do you? No, we we travel in July, August, September. We still have relatives back. My wife has relatives back in in Minnesota and Wyoming, and you know, up in Canada. And we probably travel about eight thousand miles every summer, and then come back here first of October. Uh -huh. And uh, but do you have a place up in Seattle? Yeah, well, I use my daughter's oh, place okay, so. as our. Oh, and what is her name? I don't know if I caught her name. Your daughter that lives. My my daughter lives up there is Paulette Beck, and her husband's name is is Greg Beck, and he was a Boeing man who just retired from Boeing. He's a musician. He's a great musician. Played with a lot of big name bands up in the Northwest around yeah. the country. And my daughter's retiring, so you can see how old I am. <laughs> what did she do? She is a paralegal. Oh. Been a paralegal for thirty some years. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, and your, your wife, your present wife, what, what, is, what was her name? Her My name? present wife's name is Frances, and we got married in 76. Um, we got married in December 76. My first wife got Huntington's. I don't know if you know what Huntington's is, but it's a terrible disease. It's basically cancer of the brain, and she, she was a vegetable for the last seven years she lived. And uh, I, I married Frances. We've been married now 30 years, and uh, I had two of the most beautiful women in now, did she have children before you got married? Her? Frances, no, she never had any children. So, my children are her, her only yeah. children. Yeah. And uh, what was her maiden name? Her maiden name was uh, McKibben, and then she had married a man by the name of Mullendore, and she was in the theater businesses up in the Washington area. Her and her husband had built a triple drive-in, and then they owned. She owned about seven theaters, I think, down in Tacoma. And uh, then when we got married, she sold everything and traveled with me for a couple of years, and we decided to just go and travel together. <laughs> and uh, how do you travel? I mean, just a van. I just, got a, just a van. got a Chrysler van. I get one every other year and yeah. motel it. Uh, I had motor homes, but I always tell everybody the two biggest mistakes I ever made was the two motor homes I bought. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, we enjoy traveling that way. And it's, yeah. it's easier and just as cheap. Just as cheap. Okay. As she said, when, I, when you retire, I'm going to retire. So she says, I'm not cooking in any motor homes. <laughs> do you play any golf while you're traveling? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My golf clubs are probably the first thing I load. 
I still played to a, a, a nine handicap in a little course yeah. and twelve handicap in a big course. And Very uh, good. Yeah. Uh, I just won at our place out there. I, I just happened to come in the low net club championship. And, Congratulations. About two, about two months ago, yeah. And your wife, did she play golf too? No, my wife had a, had back surgery, then she had a stroke about three years ago, and she's mm -hmm. in a walker. Mm -hmm. You saw her, you wouldn't think there was a thing wrong with her. She's 91 years old. Wow. Just a very Amazing. beautiful woman yet. Yeah. Amazing. Very beautiful. And um, she's just about blind. Amazing. She has macular degeneration, yeah, lost, that, lost yeah. one eye, and about 5% left in the other eye. But you never know anything was wrong with her. We still do everything. Otherwise, we don't dance anymore. She she used to golf. We used to golf together a lot. But it's a it's still a very good life. She loves to travel, and that, that's that's our life today. I think I heard you talk a little bit about you haven't really kept in contact with any guys that, in the service. Have no. you ever been to any reunions or anything? No, and I didn't know about it, uh, Dave, until about I think I got this book about four years ago, and how I how some we contact I don't know. But anyway, I wrote back to this man, his name is Russell Strong, and he used to be in the 367th. And he has been kind of the one behind everything, and he's kept this thing going, and they've been having reunions every year. And then the worst part was they had one in 99 in Seattle, and I didn't even know about it. And, um, but uh, it's like any other published book on something like that. Uh, the, the stories they have in there on the Rosie York is not the right story. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, it's just too bad. It, well, t uh, clear up a couple of them for us here. Well, well, the the one thing that, that, that this and this man was the engineer, and and the other man is the one that Billy has contacted. He was the radio man, but he was only with us about two missions, mm -hmm. and then he finished, or three missions. He didn't fly very many. No. But anyway, he uh, he said when we when we were the day that they were christening the airplane was at our base Thurloy, and it was a big turnout. I mean, and everybody was there. Well, then they decided they wanted to take a picture of on the Fox uh, News of us coming back from a mission and the king and queen and the princess meeting us at the base. So there was another base five miles away called Molesworth. We ran back to the barracks, threw our, and you can see right here, we threw our, our, our flying clothes right over the top of our ODs. And uh, you can see my ODs sticking up below my firing, flying clothes. Got in the airplane, went up in the air, and went over this little place of five miles away and it was five miles away, and uh, uh, we came down, and as we came down, this big motorcade came out to the airport or, where we were parking on one of the strips and greeted us as we were coming back from a mission. And that's what this is all about. And, and there's General Doolittle and the princess talking to me as, as she got down the end of the line again. Yeah. She got talking to me, and, and again, they were asking us what mission we, we weren't on a mission, but they were just trying to make up a story of where'd you come from, what'd you bomb, and this and that. But Describe the princess. The princess was an 18-year-old woman that was absolutely beautiful. She had probably the most perfect complexion I think I've ever seen on a woman. And she was as shy as, as I was. I was 21 right there. And she, she had just turned 18. And uh, she, uh, the king, as you know, the king stammered terribly, couldn't talk hard. The queen was just the opposite. They had just been over to Seattle, into Seattle in 1939. And she was started to tell me that the most beautiful place in the United States was Seattle, Washington, because it reminded her of England. And the climate is very similar, very similar climate. I found that out. But she talked to me for about probably a minute or two and talked to me about some of the missions we had flown on and, and uh, how I liked it over in England and so on and so forth. And she was a very friendly lady. And then, the, of course, Princess was shy naturally. Yeah. So was I at that time. So, but in the in this uh, book here, it, uh, it it alludes that it was an actual mission coming back to your actual base. It, we, it, was, it was a base called Molesworth, which was right. five miles away from us, and we just went up in the air. Went I, in. I know, but I mean, you're telling the story. What 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 is? Did did they say something else in this book here? In this book, I, and I can show it to you. They say. Uh, Molesworth t uh, took claim for the Princess Elizabeth being at their base, and, and of course, then this, this engineer said, that's a big lie, she, I'm the one to put this all together, and we went over to their base one day, we, were, we went up flying and so on, and was over to their base, and while we were there, the king and queen was there, and that was all a bunch of baloney. I mean, we, they had all, they'd christened the ship at our place, 
we went in and, and got our flying uniforms on, jumped in the airplane, went up and took us two minutes to get down and get over there. And then they drove over, which is only five miles away. And they came right out to the, right out where we parked the airplane with their motorcade. And there wasn't hardly anybody around because nobody knew anything about it. They were the only ones. And there was nobody from Molesworth that really knew much about it. But somebody wanted to take credit for it and it was too bad because uh, Gregory is the guy that, that really put this whole thing together. And he was the crew chief, the ground crew chief. And, but even he had it screwed up, that's what surprised me. <laughs> But that, that I'm sure, if his mind's like mine is at times, that, that could happen. But it is amazing once you start talking about this, and especially talking with you, Dave and Bill, that so many things came back to me that I hadn't, I hadn't thought of for 60 years. Never, never dreamt about it. I meant to ask you, uh, uh, did you have any problems sleeping at night, things like that, when you came back yeah. first? Well, yeah, you're right. It is, it's amazing that you ask that because all the Air Force guys, especially guys that flew, we all came back very uh, high strung. We were very high strung. If somebody went to put his finger at me, I, I'd hit him. I, I, I wouldn't even, I mean, I'd just, I'd hit him. And it took us about six months before we settled down. And remember when we got to Denver, Colorado, the I don't know if he's a psychiatrist or who he was, called us all into the theater, there's about 400 of us, and, and said they understood our problems and that we were gonna to have to overcome our own problems. It was just something that was gonna take time, and it did. I would say six, six months later, we were all probably back down to our calmness that we could be. But, and you never, you never felt that way. I mean, I never felt hyper or anything when I came home, but. I, I got married, I mean, I got up and left my wife. I, she said something to me and I wasn't going to take nothing. I mean, you were just so uptight. And uh, thank God she had enough uh, knowledge to know that I was something wrong. And we, it, it didn't turn out to be anything. But uh, it, Air Force, as they told us, Air Force men were the worst ones coming back gunners, were the worst ones coming back for something like that. I don't know why, but you were under you were under a lot of tension from the time you got on the airplane until you got back. You Stress. didn't realize you were in it, but you were you were you were tense. I mean, I always took off and landed in the tail of a B-17, and I wasn't supposed to. But I always, I never took off and landed without being in the tail, because if you crash landed, crash landed, that would break off. You always had a better chance. Or if you got blown up in the sky, you had a better chance of getting out of the tail than you would the airplane itself, because. Most of the times when they were hit, when an airplane was hit, it wasn't the gasoline that exploded, it was the oxygen system. And it was nothing to see an airplane get hit and start down like they were just wounded and they would just be weaving down like this. And then you'd see a chute come out and then you'd see another chute come out and then all at once the plane would blow up and nobody else got out. I've seen, I can remember one time, the worst one I think I ever saw was over Frankfurt, Germany, where. I saw six air, six guys jump out, and everyone their chutes were on fire. They couldn't, they couldn't, they, they, they pulled a the chute and it was on fire. Mm. But my oxygen was so, to me, it was the most dangerous thing on the airplane. We didn't smoke on the airplane actually. So the time we got into the airplane until we got back, I don't know. I don't even ever remember ever taking anything along to eat. I can remember chewing gum, that's about the only thing I can remember. And I think it's just from the tension, you, you don't get hungry, you're, it's just a natural just a natural thing to be. Well, your adrenaline's kicking up all the time, too, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Your yeah, adrenaline's just, yeah. boom, your heart's going yeah. 90 miles. You know, and you'd see some of your buddies get shot down, and you wondered, you know, are they going to get out? Are they, you, you didn't see an airplane, and you wouldn't see a, a chute get out, so then you wondered, well, did it go all the way down before they landed down there? And, you know, they're just, all these things went through your mind. And, you said those two fellows that you knew well, that you had trained with, mm -hmm. they they shot, were shot down, but they survived, and they yeah what, they, ha what happened to them again? Their airplane was hit. I saw them. I saw them go down through the clouds. That we were hit over to Augsburg, Germany. That was my first that was my first okay. mission. It was about their third, and uh, they were on fire. Their number one engine was on fire when I saw them go down through the clouds. So we thought they were goners, and uh, <clears throat> when we got back to base, we didn't know anything. And about a week later. We found out through operations that they landed their airplane in Switzerland. They landed the airplane in Switzerland. Stayed there for the whole war. So, 
then my original guy that I trained with on the stage, my original engineer and, and, and radio man, were on the same airplane and they were flying the day after we got to the base. They were flying, they flew the next day because I remember I loaned them some money and they got shot down over Germany and they were in Stalag number two. And a lot of people didn't realize this, Dave, that we could correspond with those people. We yeah. could correspond through the Red Cross. We could write letters. We couldn't say anything of any security or anything. We'd just say, how are you doing? I mean, how are they treating you? And they would they would respond back to us. I know I got two or three letters from them. Do you still I never got my money back when I got the two or three letters. <laughs> Do you still have those letters? No, no. You know, it's too bad. I, I, I destroyed so much stuff. And, you know, I had all my old flying clothes in my jacket, which was all painted up with the, everything on it. And I said to my daughter the other day, I said, you know, I think the house that we lived in back in 1950, no, oh gosh, that'd be 75, 74, 75, there was an attic upstairs, and I must have thrown everything up in this attic, and I've never got it out of there. That's Even my old college books and all is there. And I said to her, I said, you know, we should really try to get it. That's one in Palatine. No, it's the one out on 201st and oh, down in Richmond Beach. Beach. Yeah, and I just wonder, you know, because it was just an attic and it was up out of a bedroom. We had three bedrooms in the house, so we never used the bedroom. And, but I bet you all that stuff is still up there. It's still there. You ought to try. You yeah. ought to I should try to get it. You I should. might do it this summer. Like, oh, I hope you do. <laughs> I'll try. Like if I do, yeah, I'll like bring it down and show it to you. Yeah. Because my jackets all, everybody had their jackets, leather jackets, all painted up with all the missions they were on and. Okay. Uh, Ours was, was, a, was a very nice looking jacket. We had a, a, one guy in our outfit that all he did was paint the jackets. And I, I wish I could remember exactly. I, remember I, I don't exactly remember how many missions, I did, but I know I didn't get enough to get a DFC and that was 25 missions. So. Oh, we, <coughs> we didn't talk about his <coughs> commendations and no. medals that he yeah. picked up. He picked well, up a few medals. Well, being over there, of course, being an old enough outfit as we were, we had the European Theater of Operations with about five clusters to it, I think. I had the Air Medal with three clusters to it. If I'd have flown, I think, two more missions, I'd have the Distinguished Flying Cross with another cluster to it. Uh, but I, I was glad to come home. I didn't I just, need that I was medal. just going to say, yeah. I didn't need I that think medal. No. You're happy, happy yeah. to be home. You give up the medal. It was the medal. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I was probably the most surprised I was ever surprised in my life was the day I walked down there and he says, you're not flying Watson Vaughn, he says, you're going home. And why do you think that? What did they think? I, was the, I think I was the oldest man by time, seniority. the oldest gunner in seniority in there. I had been over there just about 11 months and that was old for a gunner. I mean, a lot of our gunners were there 30 days or 40 days and mm -hmm. some of them were, you know. I, I can remember one crew in our barracks flew 29 straight days. Can you imagine that? Do you remember any guys cracking up or anything like that? Oh, that yeah. Having trouble? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I saw it on our own base. I, I saw them crack up after we came in and landed. I'd see them come in and crack up. Either didn't have brakes. Two of them didn't have brakes. One, and when they built that air base there, and I don't know if the, I'm sure the stumps isn't there, but they had stumps probably as big as this whole building here, higher than this building. And it was just off of one of the runways. and. Uh, if you didn't watch out, your wingtip could get it, and this guy powered into this whole pile of, and caught the whole thing on fire. I also meant uh, by cracking up as far as uh, um, kind of psychologically, psychologically going <clears throat> and having. Uh, gosh, I'd have to stop. And think. I, I really can't say right now that anybody that I ever saw lose it. You know, right. I saw guys go off the deep end just for a, you know a day or two or something like that but, mm -hmm. but I never saw anybody commit suicide or mm -hmm. or stuff of that sort right. yeah. well I just think there was such a cohesiveness there that if you thought about committing suicide you think about what well I'm leaving my buddies alone so you would well the only one of the things you know the things that happened to you and I, I don't talk about this uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it but you, you had a, you had an armament chief along with your crew chief and they they had a little kind of a little tent they, they would sleep in it and had coffee maker and that in there and we went down there one morning uh, to go on a mission and here he was with a 45 through his head we had you know that was your armament 
Mm -hmm. Our guy, I said guy, I showed you this picture. Oh, okay. But nobody could ever figure why that happened. I mean, he, he, did, he didn't have anything to worry about as far as flying and things like that, but why it happened. But And he was just laying on the couch that way. Huh. And uh, I saw maybe men he, killed on airplanes, you know, and, and help. Well, maybe, maybe he was just worried about you guys so much that he just hard telling. Couldn't, yeah. couldn't, you know. It was, it was hard telling. I mean, you see these. He was, a, sure. yeah, he was the one who would put all the armament in place on the planes. He made sure everybody had the right amount of armament, and uh, that was his job. And you get into movies, and I'm sure it's, it's probably like that, that these guys are waiting for their plane to come back, and yeah. it doesn't show up, and it doesn't show up, you can just see it on their faces. Huh? Well, it's quite interesting, Dave. We would be in this little town of Thurloy. I mean, it's, it's a not a little town, big town. And we'd be in the pub, or we'd be with somebody, and they'd say, well, you guys lost two airplanes today, didn't you? We say, how do you know? You know, but they all they all knew how many went out and, and they came back. Yeah. How did the uh, people treat you around there? Good, very good, very good. Yeah. We were treated very good by the English, very good. Uh, I have no complaints. But they, it's amazing how much they knew about our base that we didn't even know sometimes. And um, there was nothing to. We'd sit there and watch them come back, and, and of course you could count them. Then you know how many didn't come back, but they knew before they ever got to our to our town how many didn't come back. Somebody told oh, them they hit the oh. coast, you know. Oh, I see. So there, there there was so much of that going on that I, I have no idea where it came from. Yeah. But mm, uh, they must have had a grapevine system. Oh, it probably. Was, yeah, it was from the coast spotters, probably, or yeah. whatever. Well, it, there was just so much sabotage <coughs> going on all over the island, even. You know, we never knew about it, or I mean, the, the public didn't know about it. We heard about it in our base. Mm -hmm. We saw our own airplanes being sabotaged. Yeah. Yeah. We had to then pull 24-hour guard duty on our airplanes. Huh. We lost three of them where they took off in the minute that their tail wheel, or, or their front wheels came up. It shut off a bomb. They got up in there and put us, planted a bomb up in the, up in where the wheels came up. Huh. I lost a good crew out of our barracks that way. And. Uh, how they got in there, how they did it, I never, we never ever heard. So we we pulled guard for 24 hour a day on our airplane. And that's something I've never heard about or read about yeah. ever. Did you? Oh no, no, that happened. That happened back in the early 43s, 40, yeah, early 40, hmm. early 44, early 44, probably February 44. Hmm. Because I joined that company in about the last of 43 or January 44. Right after we cracked up, and and we hadn't been there very long, and they started losing a couple. They lost two planes one time, and then about a week later they lost another one. Then they never lost anymore once we pulled the guard on it. But those bases were not secure bases. I mean, they were just farmers' fields. Actually, all around our base was just farmers' wheat fields. Uh, you could come into our base anywhere. I mean, we we didn't have to come through the main gate to get back in our base. We, can always sneak around and come into the iron farmers' wheat field, you know. Your base, what, did you have that uh, steel mats down? To no, we had, we, no, we had regular tarmac. Yeah. I, I read in our group here that we were the first base that the Germans turned over to the Americans during World War II. We were the first, Thurlay was the first the base. British? Yeah, the British turned over to us, yeah. Right. That the British turned over to us and, and it was oh. our base. So and okay. that base is still there. I mean, right. I don't know if the runways are still there. But the, the buildings are still there, and they made museums over there out of it. I've never been back. But, yeah. Huh. But it was interesting that uh, that it was the first base that they turned over. I just read that yesterday in that in that book. Uh, you, you know, I, I can't read that book because there's just so much to it, and there's four different squadrons, and you know, you're not interested at all in three of them because you don't know anybody. And do they? Does it say how many of your crew are still alive, or do you have any idea? It has it has listings in there of. Uh, all the people that's died and the people that they're still trying to find and still people I haven't heard from. I couldn't find the names of my original crew in there. I couldn't find the names of two or three of my second crew that I had. My name is not in there uh, because nobody contacted them to let them know that we we're still living or that we we're still dead. Uh, Billy told me the other day, he says, you know, it's your pilot committed suicide and I never knew that. He committed suicide in 1976, I see he died. And uh, of all the, of when I contacted, the person I contacted who has been more up on this, and he, he's kept a pretty um, ongoing relationship with 
with the 306 and, and the 357th bomb groups, and uh, he was the uh, radioman on Watts' plane, and according to him, he thought Watson was dead. According to him, it's only he and Watt are the only two left alive of that crew. And you want to realize we're all in our mid 80s or higher, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I knew that my ball chaired gunner was, was living back when they put that book out in 2002 or whenever it was because it shows him christening a replica of the Rosa York in this book. Wow. He did, I think he did it up in Detroit or someplace. His name was Curly Landerman. I remember he was out of Georgia and it had it in the book about uh, how he was rec recreated the christening of the Rosa York. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're getting close to maybe wrapping it up. Uh, okay. Bill, anything else we need to talk about here? Um, uh, there's so much going on in my mind right now. I just, I just, what, what, what? I just can't. I'm just overwhelmed. Well, he's been my hero all my life. When I was a little kid, he took care of my mom. He's always taken care of our family. And I never told him he was my hero until about last year. Yeah. But I followed him to to life. He's taken me when I no one else would have much to do with. Because I was pretty wild when I came out of the service. He gave me a job. And he told my mom, just let him go. He's got some stuff he's got to get out of his head. Just let him go. And he, yeah. he took him. And I love this man very much. And I never had the chance to tell him that. And he's taken care of so many of his family. And he is a great hero. I love you very much, Watson. That's a good ending. What? I just hate to be a baby. No, no, oh, no. Are you kidding? Oh, thank you for your God. service thank to our you, country. Babe. Thanks for coming and sharing, oh, Bill. Thanks for bringing him in. And oh, no, I'm, I'm so happy. I've been trying to do singers. this because I knew he had a story to tell. I yeah, just knew he had I'm a story. I'm just sorry that I'm such a baby. No, I, I, no, I never, God, never, never dreamed this. I never. Don't. How can you possibly feel that way? You should be proud of the fact that you can do that. Absolutely. You can let go. Yeah. You've probably held it in so long. There's so much stuff. Well, it's been so long you never think about it. I mean, it's, you know, I was thinking 64 years, that's, uh, that's a lifetime for most people. Yeah, some of them don't make it. Yeah, no, that's right. I guess, oh. I think you're like most everybody that I interview, is that when you came home, you just want to get on with your life. That's and right. This is in the past. Exactly. And, and so most of these guys have never really talked much about it at all. Exactly um, right, Dave. Um, you're exactly right. I have one guy in our park that wants to come over and speak, talk to me about the service, and I talked to him about it because he was a service man, but, and he wasn't in the Air Force, but mm -hmm. I, I don't talk to anybody unless they want to bring it up. I'll, I'll talk to him. It doesn't bother me. I don't know why. That's the first time I ever broke down. But uh, it doesn't bother me to talk about it because being in the Air Force, you, you never saw the atrocities of war. You know, you, That's true. You saw where you've been and uh, knew that at the time that you were doing wrong, but you were so brainwashed. We were so brainwashed. People don't realize how brainwashed the government got you, that you there was nobody that could beat you. I mean, we could whip anybody in the world. I mean, there was, we knew when the German fighters come, they didn't have a chance of whipping us. We knew we could just, that But you were just that brainwashed, and thank God it was. Did you feel invincible? I mean, I mean, yeah, of course, young people are like that. Yeah, you know, I think, bad I think you happen, are. Bad things happen, but yeah. it's gonna happen to somebody yeah. else, not yeah. to me. I, th I think you are, I think you feel you know, I, I never felt when I took off in the morning that I wasn't coming back. I mean, I never had that feeling. Mm -hmm. I always knew I was coming back. And, um, you know, thank God that he did help me come back. But it was a job that had to be done. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, it was either them or us. Exactly. You know, right. I mean, and it's just like I said, there's, there's, there isn't a war that's a clean war. Every war is a dirty war. I mean, look what's going on today, and everybody's criticizing this and that. It's a dirty, rotten war. I mean, you can't have a war without having all these atrocities. And it's just its just a shame that it's happening in the world today, and I know that God didn't plan it to be that way, but that's the way it is. It's too bad. Yeah, the whole world. It's just a turmoil all over. And people today, I don't think, who've never experienced any wartime activity, never grew up in it like we did, even though I was a little kid of 10 years old or so, they have no idea what we had to suffer, what we had to go without, what we did for the war yeah. effort. They don't know what it was all about.